Open our Bibles together at this time to 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. 2 Timothy 2.15 will be on page 1280 if you're just learning how to find your way around in the Word of God and if you're using our Pew Bibles. Our date today is April 8th, 2018. Our text will be in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15. And the title of this morning's message is Practical Dispensationalism. Practical Dispensationalism. And we begin with a true story about the history of the Panama Canal. Back in the 1500s, King Charles of Spain sent the Spanish explorer Hernando Cortes to the Isthmus of Panama to try to find a passage across Panama from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Because if he could, it would save ships that were traveling east and west from having to sail under South America, saving them nearly eight thousand miles of sailing. Well, as you probably know, Cortez could not find a passage across. So, he suggested digging a canal across Panama. But the king wasn't sure that that was such a good idea. And being a good Catholic, he asked the advice of the Dominican friars, who were the theologians, the Catholic theologians in Spain in those days. Well, they checked their Bibles, and they sent the king an answer that contained your first cross-reference, where the Lord Jesus Christ said, in Matthew 19, 6, What therefore God has joined together, let not man put asunder. <laughs> and they said, If God joined North and South America together in Panama, then the king had better not put them asunder by digging a canal. Now, as silly as that sounds, there are people who feel the same way about the Bible. That God has joined it all together. So God's people should not divide it. The problem with that view is, of course, that the Bible says it should be divided, as you see in our text in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15, where the Apostle Paul says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, as you can see, Paul says the way to study the Bible 
is to rightly divide it. To divide the parts that are written to us as members of the body of Christ living in the dispensation of grace from the parts of the Bible that are written to the people of Israel. Now, sometimes when we talk about rightly dividing the Word, we hear Christians say, well, that's all very interesting, but it's not really very practical. <laughs> How many of you have heard people say that? Well, this morning... We're going to see how rightly dividing the Word affects us in some very practical ways. And the first way we want to consider is how it affects which gospel you have to believe to be saved. And I know there are Christians who say there's only one gospel in the Bible and it's the one in your next reference in 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. Where Paul says, I declare unto you the gospel, the gospel by which ye are saved. And then he says, Christ died for our sins and was buried and rose again. If you're not saved this morning, you need to know that that is the gospel you have to believe to be saved. You have to believe that you can't be saved by being good like everybody thinks. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ died to save you. Amen? Amen. But... We know that that can't be the gospel that men have always believed to be saved. Because that's not the gospel the twelve apostles preached. The Lord Jesus, in your next reference, sent the twelve apostles out to preach the gospel in Luke 9, 2-6. He called His twelve disciples and sent them to preach. <clears throat> and they departed preaching the gospel. But, two years later, in your next reference, we find out they weren't preaching Christ died for our sins, were they? In Luke 18.31, He took unto Him the twelve and said, The Son of Man shall be put to death. And they understood none of these things, neither knew they the things which were spoken. Folks, they didn't even know the Lord would have to die, let alone that He would die for our sins. So, what gospel had the twelve been preaching for those two years? Well, one of the twelve apostles tells us in your next reference in John 20, 31. He said, Believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that believing ye might have life through His name. All they had to believe to be saved was that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God. But that is not enough to be saved today. Now that Christ has died for our sins, we have to believe that He died for our sins in order to be saved. And then as we rightly divide the Word, we see that there are, there's other Gospels that God asked men to believe to be saved in the Bible. In your next reference, look at the Gospel that... Abraham believed in Galatians 3.8. The Scripture preached the Gospel unto Abraham, saying... Here, I'm going to tell you the words of the Gospel. That's what that word saying means. In thee shall all nations be blessed. God told Abraham he would be a blessing to all the nations on the earth. And look what happened when he believed that gospel in your next reference in Galatians 3.6. Two verses earlier. 
Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. When Abraham believed he was going to be a blessing to all the nations, God saved him. Now God did not explain to him how he was going to be a blessing to all the nations. We now know. We now know he was going to be a blessing to all the nations by fathering the Jewish race. A race who would one day give us a Savior named Jesus. But God didn't explain that to him. And God didn't ask him to believe that. And God did not ask him to believe that he would die for our sins. He just asked him to believe what he said. And he saved him. That's another one of many proofs that we have that there's more than one gospel in the Bible. But now, when we say that, we have to be careful that people understand what we mean when we say that. We're not saying that there's more than one way to be saved in the Bible. There is only one way to be saved in the Bible, and that is by the blood of Christ. Men from the beginning of the Bible to the end have been saved by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. But men haven't always been saved by believing in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. When Abraham believed that he'd be a blessing to all nations, God took the blood of Christ and applied it to his soul and saved him. When the twelve apostles believed that Jesus was the Christ, the gospel preached to them. God applied the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ to them and saved them. In other words, they were saved by the blood, but not by believing in the blood. Men are always saved by the blood. But they believed different Gospels to access the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you think that knowing which Gospel you have to believe to be saved is a pretty practical thing, say Amen. amen. Thank you. I think so too. <laughs> and it's of primary importance. But now, usually the first thing you do after you get saved is go to church, right? But the question is, what day of the week should you go to church? In the Old Testament, everybody knows the Jews went to church on what day? The seventh day, the Sabbath, <clears throat> the, uh, Saturday. They called it the Sabbath. And there are Christians who believe that you and I should also go to church on the seventh day. I know because they write me letters at Berean Bible Society. And they quote the next reference on your sheet, Exodus 31, 15 to 18. God told Israel, six days may work be done, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest. Observe the Sabbath for a little while. Is that what your sheet said? No. For a perpetual covenant. It is a, see, a, scene. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel for a few years. Is that what your said? No. It's a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. But... Compare that to something else that the children of Israel were told to do forever in your next reference. Numbers 19, 1-10. God told those same people, Bring a red heifer. Give her unto the priest that he may slay her and sprinkle her blood before the tabernacle. It shall be unto the children of Israel a statute forever. Well, as you can see, the Jews weren't just told to observe the Sabbath forever. They were also told to sacrifice a red heifer forever. 
But now, you know why we don't do that. You know why we don't sacrifice red heifers or any other kind of animal, right? We don't sacrifice animals because we know that those sacrifices were only types of the sacrifice of Christ. But beloved, so is the Sabbath. What did the Lord say in your next reference in Matthew 11 and verse 28? Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I'll give you Sabbath. Folks, the reason the Jews were told to rest on the Sabbath was because it was a type of the rest that we have in Christ. When Jesus Christ hung on the cross and said, It is finished! He was talking about the work that was necessary for your salvation. It's done. Amen. And now all we have to do is rest in what He did. And now that we have that rest, the rest that Sabbath symbolized, we don't have to observe the symbol anymore of the Sabbath. Any more than we have to sacrifice a red heifer now that Christ has become the sacrifice that the heifer symbolized. You follow that? That's why Paul said that we meet on Sunday in your next reference. In 1 Corinthians 16, 2, he says, On the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store. And then he goes on, if I had room on the sheet, which I didn't this week, to talk about the collection for the saints that he was taking. Now listen, there is even a symbolic significance to meeting on Sunday rather than Saturday. The Jews had to work six days, then rest on the Sabbath, because that reflected how they were saved. They had to do works like sacrifices and water baptism, then they could rest. After they did those works, they could rest in knowing they were saved. Just like they could rest after working six days. See how that illustrated how they were saved? But our salvation is different than theirs. How does Paul say we're saved in Ephesians 2, verses 8 to 10, your next reference? For by grace are ye saved through faith. And, well, we didn't give you the whole thing there. We wouldn't have room. Not of works. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. Folks, we start the Christian life. We start salvation by resting in Christ. Then we work for Him after we're saved. That's why we start our week by resting. Then we work six days after that to illustrate how we are saved. Now, you can mess with God's types if you want to. You can mess with His symbols if you want to and start to meet on Saturday. <laughs> but, do you remember what happened when Moses messed with God's type in our Scripture reading this morning? When the people of Israel wanted water to drink in the wilderness, God told Moses to strike a rock and water will come out. And that's what, that's what Moses did. That's not the passage we read, but that came earlier. That was a type of Christ being smitten by God on the cross so that the water of eternal life could flow out to us. But the part we did read, when Israel got thirsty again sometime later, God told Moses this time, just speak to the rock. But instead, Moses struck it again. And that messed with God's type that he wanted to teach in your next reference in Hebrews 10.10 where it says we are sanctified through the offering of Jesus Christ once for all. 
Jesus Christ <clears throat> was smitten of God one time on Calvary's cross. Not twice. And Moses spoiled the type. And when he spoiled the type, he lost his right to enter the promised land, to live to see the promised land. Let's put it that way. He'll rise from the dead to enter the promised land someday. But that shows you how absolutely seriously God takes His types, His symbols. Of course, if you choose to meet on Saturday and not Sunday, you're not going to lose your right to enter heaven. But I doubt that God will be pleased with you marring or messing with His types. So, if you think it's a practical thing to know which day to go to church on, say amen. amen. Well, it wasn't quite as rousing, but I'll take it. <laughs> Rightly dividing the word also tells you what you can eat. Under the law, they couldn't eat meat if that meat died in a sacrifice to idols. Look at your next reference in Exodus 34, 11 to 15. God told the people of Israel, Observe thou that which I command, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land. And they go a whoring after their gods and do sacrifice to their gods and invite you to do the same. One call thee and thou eat of his sacrifice. Obviously, God was not pleased with the idea of them eating meat that died in sacrifice to an idol, right? But what does Paul say about that in your next reference in 1 Corinthians 10, 27 and 28? Paul says, If any of them that believe not, unbelievers, bid you to a feast, call thee to go to the feast, like it said in Exodus, and ye be disposed to go, whatsoever is set before you eat, asking no questions for conscience sake. But if any man say unto you, well, this is offered in sacrifice to idols, well, then he says, eat not for his sake. So in other words, you don't have to wonder if the meat you bought at Jewel last week was sacrificed to an idol. Unless you're eating with someone who still thinks we're under the law. Then you might not want to eat the meat uh, to keep from offending Him. But the bottom line is you're not offending God when you eat that meat. Now that's going to change after the rapture. In the tribulation, uh, look at your next reference, Revelation uh, twenty, uh, 2 and verse 20. And the book of Revelation, as you know, is a description of what's going to happen after the rapture in the tribulation. In that day, God, the Lord says, I have a few things against thee. Why? Because you're eating things sacrificed to idols. And so we see once again, it's going to be wrong, going to be a sin after the rapture. But in the meantime, I mean, unless you want to think God has a few things against you, <laughs> you better rightly divide the word and learn that you can eat meat like that. And this isn't just an issue overseas, you know, in some superstitious land. Thornton told me years ago a guy used to come to his dad's farm to buy chickens to sacrifice to idols. This is something that is still current even in our so-called enlightened land that we live in. You know, the land that's getting more superstitious and pagan all the time. Well, under the law, Jews also weren't supposed to eat unclean food, right? But that was also something that was symbolic. God told the Jews that certain foods were unclean to teach them that certain people were unclean, the Gentiles. Look at your next reference in Leviticus 20, verses 24 and 25. God told them, I, I am the Lord your God, which have separated you from other people. 
Ye shall therefore, because I separated you Jews from the Gentiles who are unclean, ye shall therefore put difference between clean beasts and unclean beasts. And you know what? We know that the Apostle Peter understood that symbolism because when God told him to eat some unclean things, look what he said in Acts 10. Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Peter says, nothing doing. Not so, Lord. I've never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again, What God has cleansed, that call not thou common. And we know he finally understood the significance because later he said, God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Peter understood that unclean meats were only symbolically unclean. And now that they weren't symbolically unclean anymore, the Gentiles weren't unclean anymore. So, if you have friends or loved ones or whoever you're talking to who thinks that unclean meats are still unclean, ask them if they think the Gentiles are still unclean. Because that's what the symbolism was there for, folks. But I don't have to tell you, the Apostle Paul knows that you and I, as Gentiles, are not an unclean people because of what he says in 1 Timothy 4, 4 and 5. He said, Every creature of God is now good, nothing to be refused, if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by two things, the Word of God and prayer. Now, you know what he means when he says that the unclean foods that you eat are sanctified by prayer. It's by, by the prayer of thanksgiving you get before you eat them. But when he says the unclean foods are sanctified by the Word of God, that cannot mean they're sanctified by the Word of God from the law. That cannot mean they're sanctified by the Word of God that you read in Leviticus 11 because that Word of God says certain meats should be refused. Those unclean meats, folks, are only sanctified by the Word of God rightly divided. They are only sanctified by the Word of God to you and I through the Apostle Paul. But that wasn't true until Paul's ministry. It wasn't true until Peter was used of God to introduce Paul's ministry. And I say that because there's a real serious problem with the New International Version in your next reference of Mark 7 and verse 19. People who use the NIV think that in Mark 7, 19, the Lord made all foods clean at that time. So let's read what it says. <clears throat> in Mark 7, 19, the Lord said, Whatsoever thing from without entereth into the man, it cannot defile him, because it entereth not into his heart, but into the belly, and then goeth out into the draft, purging all meats. And then, for some unknown reason, the NIV adds, in saying this, Jesus was declaring all foods clean. Now that wasn't a little note at the bottom of the page. That wasn't a little note in the center column like Schofield puts his. That was right there as if it was part of the Word of God. And folks, those words are not in the correct Greek text. They don't belong in the Bible. The Lord was not declaring all foods to be clean, all foods that used to be unclean under the law, in Mark chapter whatever 7 there. And you know that. Because if He was, you know what Peter would have done? He would have started eating unclean foods, right? But what did he say in Acts 10? I have ne later on, a couple of years later, I've never eaten unclean foods. That's how you know the Lord didn't make unclean foods clean in Mark chapter 7. 
The Lord was just talking about your body's natural ability to cleanse food and let all the unclean part go out in the draft. And if you don't know what the draft is, the Bible word for an outhouse is a draft house. So um, I was looking that up the other day and I, I get a kick out of it every time I read about it. There was a Jewish king that, that destroyed the temple of Baal, the false god, and they made an outhouse out of the out of the temple of Baal. After that, you just gotta love that. <laughs> there, there was a king that had a sense of humor, right? Well, the bottom line is, if you think it's practical to know you can eat catfish and bacon without making God angry, say amen. amen. That's that's what I thought. I knew I'd get a, a rousing amen on that one. <laughs> If you don't rightly divide the word, you can't know what to do when you get sick. Look what King Asa... Hey, by the way, that's King Asa. He's the one that made the temple of the idol an outhouse. <laughs> Look what Asa did under the law when he got sick. Second Chronicles 16, verse 12. <clears throat> Asa was diseased, yet he sought not to the Lord, but to the physicians. Well, I got a question for you. How many of you have ever seen a physician? Raise your hand. Look at all the sinners. Yeah. Of course, you'd only be a sinner under the law. Look what Paul says about physicians in Colossians 4.14. He calls Luke the beloved physician. Now, do you think he'd be calling Luke the beloved physician if it wasn't okay to go see a physician? Listen. After the gift of healing faded away, I'll bet you the, Dr. Luke got to be really beloved of the Apostle Paul with all the beatings and stonings and things that he'd experienced. And all, you think you got aches and pains you wake up in the morning? I'll bet you his, 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 his bones were creaking a symphony when he woke up in the morning. Well, listen, I am sure that the physicians who treated Rex's uh, appendix when it burst, I'll bet you they were dear to him because that would have took his life. I'll bet you to some of you who've had heart surgery. Well, didn't you have heart surgery, Linda? I'll bet you your physicians were dear to you, like Luke was beloved of, of uh, the Apostle Paul. So if you're thankful it's not a sin to see a doctor, say amen. amen. There you go. You know, if you don't rightly divide the word and you get a disease, you might think that God is spanking you, chastening you, punishing you for your sins like He did David in your next reference in Psalm 38, verses 1 through 8. David said, O Lord, rebuke me not in thy wrath, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. And then he describes the chastening he'd been given. There's no soundness in my flesh. My wounds stink and are corrupt because of my foolishness. My loins are filled with a loathsome disease. Listen, under the law, God chastened people with sickness if they were foolish enough to disobey Him. Amen. So today, when Christians get cancer, they sometimes think that the reason they're filled with that loathsome disease is because they sinned and God is chastening them. But listen, punishing somebody when they're bad is how you treat young children, folks. And Paul says in your next reference that you're not a child. Not in his eyes. In Galatians chapter 4, 1 to 7, Paul says, The heir, as long as he is a child, differs nothing from a servant. Even so, we, when we were in children, were in bondage, but God sent forth his Son to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. Ye are sons, no more a servant, no more a child, but a son. God sees you as an adult son, and I don't know about you, but I'm not still spanking my adult son, Jesse. That boy won powerlifting competitions. <laughs> And if I were to try to spank him, it would not end well for me. Let's put it that way. 
And God is not spanking His adult son either. Now you say, well, wait a minute. Paul says the Corinthians were part of the body of Christ that we're a part of. They were being spanked. They were being chastened. Well, yeah, because of the way they were observing the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians 11. When you come together to eat the Lord's Supper, one, of his, one is hungry because somebody else is hogging food and another is drunken. And uh, for this cause, because of that, many are weak and sickly among you. And many are dead. But listen, Paul wrote that during that transition period from law to grace, folks. You go home and read the very next chapter and he spends two chapters, two or three chapters talking about tongues and healing and all those other things that were part of the transition period. All those other things that are no longer part of the program of God. And I don't personally think that chastening is either. The reason is, is we don't have something that God needs to chasten you. We don't have a prophet who can tell us when we're being chastened. Listen, David had Nathan to tell him that his child was going to die because of his sin with Bathsheba, right? The Corinthians had Paul to tell them that some of them were sick and dying because of their sinfulness. But we don't have apostles. We don't have prophets today in the dispensation of grace. We don't have anybody who can make the connection between your sin and some chastening, some disease, I should say some disease or some sickness that you're getting in your life. And you will drive yourself stark raving crazy trying to connect those dots yourself. Because you can't do it. Because God's not doing that. Do you have any idea how many people are literally haunted by the thought that they're dying of some disease because God's spanking them? Or worse, they think their child is dying of some disease because God is chastening them. Something that they did as a parent. If you think it's practical to know you get sick just because you're living in a sin-cursed world, say amen. amen. If you don't rightly divide the Word, you're likely to think that you can't charge interest when you loan somebody money. You know what? Under the law, the Jews couldn't. Look at your next reference. If thou, in Exodus 22-25, if thou lend money to any of my people, God says, thou shalt not be to him as a usurer, neither shalt thou lay upon him any usury. You know what the Bible word for interest is? Usury. Now, the reason they couldn't charge each other interest was well, because of what we read in your next reference in Proverbs 22 and verse 7. The borrower is servant or slave to the lender. And if you know your Bible, you know Jews weren't allowed to make servants of their brethren, were they? That's why he, they couldn't charge each other interest. Because that would make their brethren their servant. We see both these ideas together in your next reference in Leviticus 25, 35 to 46. God says, If thy brother be waxen poor, take thou no usury of him. And then he says, If thy brother that dwelleth by thee be waxen poor, thou shalt not compel him to serve as a bondservant. But as a hired servant, you can have a servant who's a Hebrew, you've got to pay him though. Thy bondmen, your slave, shall be of the heathen. Of them you shall buy bondmen, and they will be your possessions. They could buy and sell people and own people, as long as they weren't part of the people of Israel. They could own slaves of the heathen, and they could charge usury to the heathen. But they couldn't do those things to their brethren. But how about today? Can we charge interest to God's people today? Well, you know what? 
That proverb is still true. The borrower is still servant to the lender. And if you don't believe me, just try taking out a loan and not paying it back. They will hunt you down like a runaway slave. <laughs> but listen, under grace, there is no reason why you can't charge interest to your brethren. Because under grace, you can own a slave who's a believer. You know that? Now, under the laws of the United States, you can't do that. <laughs> but, but Paul never tells masters to free their slaves, does he? He never tells slaves to run away from their masters, even if they are believing masters. What does he say in 1 Timothy 6, 1 and 2? Servants that have believing masters, let them run away, right? No! Let them do service. Bottom line, folks, is, is if you ask a Christian for a big loan, don't be leaning on him to make it an interest-free loan. And if you, you lend money to another believer, there's nothing wrong with charging him interest. You can make a believer your servant by charging him interest if you want to. Now, if you're thinking, well, that doesn't sound like a very Christian thing to do, I would suggest to you that you don't do anybody any favors by, by giving interest fee loans, and I'll tell you why. I have an old friend, actually is a friend of my brother's, who um, when he got married and went to buy a house, this is uh, back in the 80s, I guess, interest rates were double digit in those days. I mean, now you can get a loan for what, 2, 3%, 4, 5, I don't know. But we're talking 15, 16, 17% in those days. And his parents watched him go to buy a house and they did not want to see their son saddled with a humongous debt like that. You know what they did? They loaned him the money. But they charged him interest. A much lower interest rate, but they charged him interest. Now, maybe you're thinking, all oh, those meanies, why didn't they just give the kid the money? Well, you know what? They knew the kid needed to learn responsibility. They knew they weren't going to do him any favor if they just gave him the money. So you know what they did? They went to see a lawyer, had a contract drawn up, and had their son sign the contract. And I would submit to you, you don't, believe, you don't do a believer any favor by giving him an interest-free free loan either. History is littered with friendships that have been destroyed by loaning people money. <laughs> if you haven't heard the stories, they're out there. So if you think it's a practical thing to know what God says about that, say Amen. amen. If you don't rightly divide the word, you're going to be confused about divorce in a lot of areas, but let's just pick one. Under the law, if a man married an unbelieving wife, you know what the spiritual thing to do if you married an unbelieving wife? The, uh, the spiritual thing to do was to divorce her. Look what Ezra says in Ezra 10, 1-3. Some people said to Ezra, we've trespassed, ag trespassed against God and have taken strange wives of the people of the land. And maybe you're thinking, well, my wife's pretty strange too. But what it means is the unbelieving heathen wives. And, uh, and then, so look, but then look what he says. He says, let us make a covenant with our God to put away all those wives. And you know what that word put, those words put away, that's the Bible word for divorce. They made a covenant with God to get a divorce. And then they said, and let it be done according to the law. There was a divorce process they had to follow. But today, if you're foolish enough to marry an unbeliever, I told you what happens when you marry a child of the devil, you're going to have problems with your father-in-law. Right? Who's your father-in-law if you marry a child of the devil? Never mind. If you're foolish enough to marry an unbeliever, in the dispensation of grace, Paul says the exact opposite. In 1 Corinthians 7, verse 12, he says, If any brother have a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not divorce her. Let him not put her away. If you think it's a practical thing to know what God says about divorce, say amen. amen. Lastly, if you don't rightly divide the word, you're not 
you're not going to know how to give to the Lord's work. I get asked about tithing at least once a month at Brian Bible Society, and there's a lot that we could talk about it. We've talked about it not too long ago. The main thing to remember about tithing is this, folks. What God said to the people of Israel in Malachi 3.10, He said, Bring ye all the tithes, and prove me now with those tithes, saith the Lord, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and just pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. I didn't even have room enough to receive the word it there. That's how tight the reference sheet was this week. <laughs> well, listen. When God says, prove me now, He said, test me now. That's what the word prove means. We, if I had room, I'd have showed you some Bible verses that show you that. But you know where they take cars to test them, right? They take them to a proving ground. And they test the cars there. So God was telling me, telling them, you pay me your tithes and test me. Test me to see if I won't bless you in return so much you won't be able to receive it. Now you compare that to how the Apostle Paul uses the word prove or test in your last reference in 2 Corinthians 8, verses 7 through 9. Paul says, and he's talking about Christian giving, abound in this grace also. He doesn't call it tithing, he calls it gracing. And then he says, I speak not by commandment. The tithe was a commandment, folks. Paul says, I speak not by commandment, but I am speaking to prove you, to test you, to prove the sincerity of your love. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, yet for your sakes He became poor, that ye, through His poverty, might be rich. Beloved, God has already opened the windows of heaven. He's already opened them when He sent His Son to die for you. Now He's proving you to see what you'll give Him in return for what He's given you. See the difference? Under the law, God's said, give to me and I'll bless you in return. Under grace, He says, I've already blessed you. Now won't you give to me in return? He's already blessed you with the biggest blessing imaginable. The death of His Son. Now what do you imagine you should give Him in return for that? That's the difference between tithing and gracing. So now the only question is, are you going to pass that test? How much are you willing to give God in return for all He has done for you? And I'm not just talking about your money. How much of your life are you willing to surrender to Him? How much of your will are you willing to surrender to His will? I mean, when God tells you His way and you think to yourself, but I want to do it my way, are you willing to surrender that? What do you say we pray about that? Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this challenging message from Your Word, especially this issue of gracing. We are so blessed. We are above, uh, of all people, most blessed. And that should cause us, of all people, to be the most thankful. And that should move us above all people, to surrender our lives, our will, our money, and everything we have to Thee. May it be so, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.